It's now time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. Today, the combatants over Nigeria's disputed 2023 presidential election will enter the final phase of their legal tussle. Three separate appeals have been listed against the judgment of the presidential election tribunal, which affirmed the Electoral Commission's declaration of President Inubu as the winner of the election held on February the 25th. The applications for the review of that ruling have been made by Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party, Peter Obi of the Labour Party and the Allied People's Movement. While Atiku presented 35 grounds on which he's asking the court to nullify the judgment of the tribunal, Obi has presented 51 grounds of appeal. Meanwhile, the number of justices on the Supreme Court will drop to 10 on Friday after Justice Musa Datijo retires at the age of 70. A statement by the court's director of press and information, Akonde Festus, says that a special valedictory court session will be held in his honor to mark his retirement. The special court session is to be presided over by the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Olukayode Ariwola who will pay tribute to Justice Datijo alongside other major stakeholders in the nation's justice sector. All right, Kay, good morning. It's a new week and we have news. This uh, day marks the beginning of the final phase, as I mentioned earlier on, of uh, who will be the substantive president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Ah, I don't know. That's a big issue for all Nigerians. We're all concerned. We're all wondering what will be the decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, and I don't think we're going to get that decision today. Uh, from all I can see, obviously, uh, we would expect the cases to be presented. The appeal will be presented. So I guess in the coming days, we'll begin to see... Um, a final light at the end of that tunnel and we'll have a decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, my understanding of it is um, former Governor Peter Obi and presidential candidate of the Labour Party, he has presented 51 uh, grounds for appeal and one of them is the fact that he does not believe that um, it is right for INEC to not do what he promised to do. And there are so many other ones that he's mentioned out of that 51. You can go online and you'll find all the, all the grounds for appeal there. The same thing with um, uh, Atiku Abubakar. He's also presented his own. Uh, the case is in court, so that means we have very little to say on it. I can't dwell on the substance of the case. But what we can say again and again and again, until the Supreme Court makes the decision, the only thing we can say is we've got eyes on the Supreme Court, eyes on the judiciary, and we're praying uh, like all prayers to the court that they will do the right thing. And also you mentioned earlier, uh, or just a few seconds ago, that um, the Supreme Court justices, the numbers have reduced. Yes, the numbers is reduced to 10 now. And um, I think there's about three or four female uh, women in that uh, Supreme Court. So it will be right for the incumbent president, uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinumbu, to very quickly find amongst the members of the judiciary people that are qualified that can go in and do a good job. Part of the reason we're having delays in cases and it's affecting what we call the rights of people is when we don't have enough people on the bench in the Supreme Court. That means only 10 people will be available and they cannot hear all cases. If we have up to 20, then it makes it a lot easier. So the president shall act very swiftly and make sure that people are appointed, especially there need to be more women representation in the Supreme Court because there are so many cases that require that which is the nuances of a, a woman and understanding of a woman in cases that are, you know, apply to uh, women issues. So we need to have that representation, but the number has to increase. So um, that's my position. All right, okay, thanks. Rufai. I mean, so there's a lot. I mean, we've constantly said this is now being pushed to the court. The court will make their decision. The Supreme Court starts today. Let's see how that pans out. Uh, after whatever judgment the Supreme Court gives, Nigerians will look at it again and will dominate public space. Nobody has the right, I can't repeat for the upturn time, 
to take away the cut of public opinion from Nigerians from talking. And uh, that's our right as enshrined in the Constitution, number one. Number two, also that's the role of the media. That's why the media has a constitutional role. And I have to say that for the opt-in time. But apart from that, I'd like to just align with what uh, uh, Kay did say here as regards you know, getting more judges on the Supreme Court. I think that's a process Nigerians now need to participate. We need to know these people. Once they are nominated to get on the court, these are the things we need to, you know, put our eyes in the process. Because a Supreme Court judge takes a decision that would affect generations to come. And they weigh over decisions that affect generations to come. And it's only right for the people to be able to have an input in their process via the court of public opinion, not necessarily swaying anything, but via the court of public opinion, checking antecedents and having robust engagements with the process when that process finally comes. And I hope that Nigerians will open their eyes and when the nominations are made, because definitely we definitely need to fill the court, when the nominations are made, Nigerians will be able to scrutinize the process effectively and ensure that they have their voices heard in that process because it is paramount and the decisions of the judiciary go a long way in the lives of Nigerians. Just like whatever decision the Supreme Court is going to take, it's definitely going to go a long way in the life of Nigerians. So we'll see how the process pans out. And when we're finally done with the process, we'll come here, we'll reconvene, and we'll also, you know, boisterously analyze. Absolutely, yes. Um, all eyes, obviously, on the judiciary and uh, well, so as it's in court, we, there are limits to which we can uh, talk about the case just to present the facts of the case. As I already mentioned, uh, the grounds of appeal from the Labour Party, a light people's movement, we, we mustn't forget. And of course, uh, Mr. Uh, Waziri Atiku Abubakar, who um, held a press conference over the weekend. Now, in terms of the uh, number of justices in the Supreme Court, Constitutionally, there's a provision to have 21. 21 in terms of the numbers of justices on the, you know, at, at the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, currently we're now down to 10. Last week, I talked about the fact that during Justice Amna Oge's uh, valedictory service, she had actually advocated for more appointments to the Supreme Court, talking about how uh, labored the um, current justices are because they are limited in numbers and the cases are overwhelming. Of course, you can only imagine what the impact on the process of justice will be and also, um, obviously, um, hope, hopefully not impacting on the quality because they're just literally overwhelmed. And um, the duty of, of, of recruitment of justices is lies in the purview of the National Judiciary Council, NJC. Now, the spokesperson, Mr. Festus Akonde, had actually said that they were in the process of uh, the, the nominations would come in, the process of recruitment, and so they'd reach an advanced stage in terms of that. At, currently, they would need to fill in 11 spaces, and as has been mentioned, hopefully that'll be balanced. But most importantly um, is the quality of and uh, you know and the antecedents of the individuals who will then go on to be appointed as justices of the Supreme Court. I think this is very important, and perhaps it's also a great time to advocate for the independence of the NJC of the judiciary of of the judiciary in Nigeria. This is something that has been talked about a number of times. Um, the, in the legal profession, lawyers have spoken about this independence of the judiciary and showing that they have full autonomy as they ought to, so that they are not you know there's no external influence, especially with regards to the executive um, in, in this regard. So this is definitely, um, you know, one area that we must continue to talk about until there are changes made in this area. We have talked about it endlessly on the welfare of judges. I believe the Supreme Court justices have a you know, definitely better treatment than perhaps their um, um, justices in other lower courts. But it is important to highlight that. Again, also an opportunity to say that Nigerians are expectant especially with regards to the outcome of the ruling of the Supreme Court's hearing of the Article OB and APM appeals. Don't forget one of the things they'd be considering, or perhaps one of the things that people will be looking forward to knowing is if the Supreme Court will admit fresh evidence due to extenuating circumstances, as in the case of um, the, um, the deposition and the findings from Chicago State University, certificate forgery and the likes. We'll find that out um, very shortly. Well, move on to our next story for this morning. The Court of Appeal has nullified the victory of the Senate Minority Leader representing Plateau North Senatorial District, Simon Nwankwon. 
in a unanimous judgment, the three-member panel led by Justice Daudu Williams held that the People's Democratic Party did not validly nominate Senator Simon Wadquart. The court also held that 12 local government areas didn't participate in the Congress held by the party. The court also ordered a rerun for the Plateau North senatorial seat to be conducted in 90 days. The court also cited non-compliance with the subsisting court order from the Plateau State High Court made in 2020 for the PDP to conduct Congress before nominations. Another court panel led by Justice Okon Abang nullified the victory of Musa Aga Avia of the People's Democratic Party representing Basa North in the House of Representatives. All right, okay, okay. Um, come to your reply, would you like to share your thoughts? I mean, so I think you remember when we had uh, the first conversation, I think we had a, sen a senator from Plateau, uh, I forget his name now, was formerly in the military, you know. And the, t the issue of the nomination and the discrepancies as regards what happened in Plateau have been raging for a bit. Yeah. The PDP getting its house in order, the factionalization, as it were, of the PDP housing in Plateau, it robbed off, obviously, on the senatorial candidates. And now, this is the first Senate casualty it's taking. It's also taking, you know, people in the House of Reps. It's also even taking as much as people that were nominated for local positions in Plateau states. And now, a lot of people have argued that, yeah, this is a pre-election matter. But this matter keeps on raging on. And they keep on referring to that court judgment in 2020 that they should go out there, you know, to fix their house and validly nominate people. So what they're claiming in this court judgment is that the, uh, 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 Matt Wang was not, you know, holistically nominated. Although the arguments on the part of the PDP people differ, but it's a case that has been raging on because of the internal party crisis. And that's the crisis that is really eating deep into the PDP. There are many casualties, and this is not going to be the only casualty. Mm. If the Court of Appeal can rule like this, there's been another case that I've been thrown out. I forget the name of it. His name is in my head now. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I forget his name now. His case went south in the tribunal because of this same issue. He's another senator from that plateau, same PDP senator. So if the court rules this way, as regards the same issue, then it might be problematic also. But I don't want to preempt the court on what his case might be and all of that. But it's been a raging case as regards the division and disparity in the house, the PDP family in plateau states. Yeah, Bali. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Senator, no. Sen Sen senator Napoleon Bali. Yeah, actually... All right. We had Senator Napoleon Bali in. And he also gave another side to this particular debacle going on. Because in his case, this was the same issue that affected him. Now, it has finally taken his first casualty because they have to redo the elections, obviously. Because for senatorial elections, after the Court of Appeal, there's no higher grant again to go. It all terminates at the Court of Appeal. And once the Court of Appeal is ruled, that's it. So it has taken his first casualty. And that's why we keep talking about internal democracy in yes. political parties, because this we keep claiming casualties. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, like you've rightly mentioned, the meat of this is the fact that um, Chris Gewa, who had, yeah. that's the APC candidate, had um, filed a petition that the PDP didn't have structure at the time when um, Senator, when Senator, um, when the Honorable Wan Kwon had won the primaries, therefore making him, uh, making his candidature null and void and this is something that the court has agreed to and like you've analyzed unfortunately we possibly this is not the end of this we possibly might see a few more casualties from this with regards to internal structure it's not just the pdp that's fallen um, prey to this other parties um the labor party especially in the last election in some states has fallen prey to this internal structure um the process by which a candidate emerges we've seen issues where even um the areas where um uh 
primaries were conducted has come under contention. So a few things around that. And, and I, I believe it just points to the fact that in terms of our political architecture, not just in the conduct of elections, but even in the way that our parties are constituted, so political parties are constituted, we still haven't yet been able to get it right. One way or the other, um, you know, the men emerge, men and women emerge as candidates, whether the process is by constitution of the party or not, whether an INEC observer is there or not. And then what this happens or what this means is that the people waste their time at the polling unit or polling booth and then the courts end up deciding who, sh who emerges. So it does, it's no longer about the person who or the people's favorites in terms of the number of votes, it then becomes a court matter and a court issue. And that's what we're hoping, the lessons that we can learn from the previous election to prevent a reoccurrence, especially we talked about how, you know, the conduct of the elections by INEC, INEC as an um, umpire, how well they did, and just the fact that when these continues to happen, it increases voter apathy as people do not have confidence in the process of elections. And these are the critical lessons that we must learn from the last election.